Well, this is the fourth message in the series called Perfect Strangers, and we left off last week. Balky and Larry had a date planned. And no, no, it's, for some of you that know, it's about the old TV series. Uh, that's where we got the idea for the series. But no, we're in the book of First Peter, and we've spent all our time there, and we will. We're just going verse for verse, line for line. And First Peter, uh, three times, points to Christians as being strangers in this world. And we've looked in past weeks that we're considered strange sometimes because we have a strange world view. We believe in an invisible God. We've never seen him. We've never heard his voice. But we believe that he has chosen to reveal himself, cause it to be put down in print, protected it, preserved it, passed it on to us, and we take it as the trustworthy revelation of the truth about God and the truth about life. And all of our world view is formed from what we find in God's word. And that's strange in society today. And from that worldview, we end up with a set of strange values. You know, we care about spiritual values. We care about eternal values. We don't look at life from a temporal standpoint. Therefore, we don't live desperately. We don't feel like we have to get it all in this life because we know better. Nobody gets it all in this life. Nobody lives long enough. And if you get it all, it's imperfect anyway. So we live in light of eternity. And we're not in a panic and we're not desperate. We know that this life is a developmental journey. We have a different set of values. Things that are important to us seem strange to those that are outside of Christ. Things that are important to them, we no longer necessarily find value in. And then we found last week that we also have a purpose that makes us strange because we have this purpose given to us by God, this grand opportunity and calling that we are to be those that effectively communicate the message of Christ to our generation. Each generation has that opportunity. Each generation has that calling. And in order to effectively communicate this message of Christ, we learn that we have to live lives that contrast with the rest of society. We are to be noticeably different, noticeably Christ-like, so that when we then share the message of Christ, it has some credibility. And so that's where we left off last week. Now, today we're going to see that Peter wants followers of Christ, Christians, to be motivated in some ways that once again make us strange. Motivated to do certain things and motivated because of certain things. And once again, these, these put us in a position where to outsiders, those outside of Christ, those who haven't yet learned who they are, why they're here, and that they were made by Christ and for Christ, and that apart from Christ, no human life ever coheres, ever finds its identity, ever becomes who or what they were meant to become, never does what they were meant to do apart from Christ. Just like a fish was made for water, human beings were made for Christ. But for those that are still apart, still resistant, still asserting their own will, like we all have at times, those that follow Christ now can sometimes look strange. And strange... Because we're motivated to do some things that to those that are still outside of the purpose of God look just undesirable. So let's turn to the book of 1 Peter now. And uh, the page numbers will be there. And, you know, we're in chapter 2. I'm not sure if that'll take you right to chapter 2. It might be chapter 1, but you can flip. And last week we left off in chapter 2, verse 12. And I actually want to start back there again in verse 11 to kind of get our... Uh, context for everything else because it, the rest of these verses sort of flow from the context that's developed in verse 11 and particularly verse 12. First Peter chapter 2 verse 11 it starts out dear friends I urge you as aliens in what's the word strangers in the world to abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul. We talked about that last week. Verse 12. Live such good lives among the pagans. Now that's just those that are, you know, outside of Christ. They haven't been reconciled to God. Live such good lives. It's not a motorcycle gang we're talking about here in specifically. But live such good lives among the pagans that though they, and what is the word? Accuse. Though they accuse you of doing wrong. So these pagans are accusing Christians, followers of Christ, of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. So here we find, once again, this need for living a lifestyle that con contrasts 
with the rest of society in a positive way. He's concerned that, that the accusations of the pagan community might stick, might have credibility, unless our lives are evidently actually different. Now, last week I introduced to you some of the accusations that the recipients of this letter were actually undergoing. Uh, this takes place in 64 AD, this letter, and I've shared with you each week, this was the first time that the Christian community, followers of Christ, were, were now being persecuted by the Roman Empire. They had never been persecuted by the Roman Empire before, but it all changed in 64 AD with Nero. Nero and the burning of Rome, uh, word is that he probably burned it himself because he wanted to do some building of his own, but he blamed it on the Christian community because he needed a scapegoat. And then all kinds of accusations about the Christians developed, and they were all negative. And so I had this little box last week, and I'll share it with you once again. These were some of the accusations that the Christians' lives had to sort of ward off. The Christians were accused of torching Rome, which they absolutely did not do. That was Nero's uh, ploy. They were accused of cannibalism, and I know this sounds strange to us today, but the Christians were accused of cannibalism because we celebrate the Lord's Supper, you know how, and we say that the bread represents the body of Jesus and the juice represents the blood of Jesus. Well, the community, you know how word gets spread in a negative way, they hear this and they start spreading a rumor that the Christians would take a young child, offer it as a human sacrifice, eat its flesh and drink its blood at the communion. And so this made the Christians very odious, you know, to the rest of the Roman community. They were also accused of having grotesque orgies, but what this was, the Christians had what they called love feasts. It was essentially a worship service, but they had a whole full-blown meal, and they celebrated communion at it. But the Roman and the Greek world did have grotesque orgies, and they just put this worst-case scenario construction on the Christians. They were accused of being damaging to trade, and that was actually true. If you were to read that passage in Acts 19 that I have up there, you find that as the message of Christ was preached in areas where idolatry, the worship of idols, stone and brass and wood idols was practiced, that people would abandon these idols. They would know that God is spirit and they would stop buying the idols, which was big trade, and it was causing commerce to suffer. And the trade unionists were attacking Christians. So you read Acts 19, you find this. That was actually true. We Christians were kind of damaging to the idol-worshiping commerce of that day. Uh, the other charge, the accusation against Christians in those days, was that Christians were destructive to families. And this is partially true as well. Those passages in Matthew and in Luke, if you were to read them, you see that Jesus just lays it on the line. He says, listen, if you put father, mother, brother, sister, husband, wife, anyone before me, you can't be my disciple. And the truth of the matter is, is that particularly in Jewish homes where the first followers of Jesus were all Jews, they would turn to him and say, we believe he's the Messiah, but they might have a husband or a wife or a brother, or sister, or uncle, grandmother, grandfather say, no, we don't. And you'd be abandoned, you'd be lost to the family, and you'd have to be willing to be considered as dead to your family. And so there was, quite honestly, some disturbance of families because of people's supreme allegiance to Jesus. Today, that's probably just the opposite, with the exception if we were living in a Muslim land. Uh, then you'd probably have the same kind of thing. They were accused of just being haters of mankind. The, the, the word was that the Christians hated everybody except their own, which obviously made the Romans have contempt for them. But it wasn't true. What the Christians actually taught was that, that they hated this world system because in 1 John chapter 2, it says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. It says that they're not from God. The pride of life, the things of what we have and what we do, our pride, our boasting, this system of greed and exploitation and power and corruption, that's not God's kingdom. And so the Christians said, We hate that, but we love people. People created in the image of God, people for whom Jesus died. And so this bad rumor began to be spread around in those days. And then the last one was partially true. The rumor was spread that these Christians, they're dangerous because they're disloyal to Caesar. Now you're going to see when we get into this passage, that actually was not completely true. But it was partially true in this regard. When the Christians were brought into the arena... And they were forced to make a decision. And they would say, is Caesar your Lord? Is Nero your Lord? Or is Jesus your Lord? These Christians would say, Jesus is our Lord. And in many cases would lose their lives instantly because of that. 
Now, they didn't try to upset the government. You'll see this in a minute. Quite the contrary, they were model citizens and commanded of God to be so. But they were, they were falsely accused. But if it came to a, a decision between loyalty, heart, spirit, soul, allegiance, allegiance to only one, would they, would they agree on it? And that was to Jesus. So today, we're probably accused of um, a lot of things similar and then contrary too. We mentioned some of them last week. But the key is this, is we are to live in such a way that those accusations lose their power, lose their credibility. Maybe some of you have had the experience of being around somebody that is an aggressive non-Christian who dislikes Christians, thinks they've kind of pigeonholed all of us into one little uh, caricature. But then as they get to know you, all the caricatures just begin to break down. And they start to say, you know, this person doesn't fit into that that mold, that negative mold that I had tried to put all Christians in. That's good. That's what our lives are meant to do. All right. With this as a background, we want to go to the text and think about the idea that Peter wants to motivate Christians to do two things essentially in this passage. To be strategically, and I'll explain that in a minute, strategically submissive people. And we'll unpack what submissive means. He also wants Christians, followers of Christ, to be willing to be strategic, sacrificial sufferers. In other words, he wants Christians to be willing to suffer unjustly, sufferings they do not deserve, but for strategic, overarching reasons. Not just for the sake of suffering, as though suffering itself is meritorious. Scripture never teaches that at all. But he wants Christians to actually be motivated, to be excited, to be enthusiastic about submission, and if necessary, sacrificial suffering. So let's go to the text, and I hope this will be um, much more clear to all of us. All right. We've already read verse 11 and 12. Now I'm going to pick up in 12 one more time just to give us the flow in the context. It says, live such good lives among the pagans... That though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Now our text. Submit. There's the first word. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every authority instituted among men. Whether to the king as the supreme authority or to the governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. For it is God's will that by doing good... You should silence the ignorant talk of foolish men. Now pause for a minute. The people that Peter was writing to, they were being torn out of their houses in some cases, arrested and dragged into the arena, tortured and killed simply because they were following Christ, not because they committed any crime at all. And Peter is writing to them and he is telling them that they are to give submissive cooperation to the king who at that time was Nero the one that was out to persecute the Christians look at it again in that context submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every authority instituted among men whether to the king which was Nero at that time the persecutor as the supreme authority or to governors who were sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. Now that's what God intends their role to be. They're to punish those that do wrong. Commend those that do right. But in the case of Christian persecution, that wasn't happening. Which made it probably a lot tougher for these recipients of the letter. But Peter was saying, listen, even though you have an evil king. And he has evil law enforcement people that are coming. And instead of rewarding the good and punishing the evil, they are punishing the good for the pleasure of the evil in the arena, he said, still, submit. Now, let me just say this. We'll look at another passage in a minute, and you'll see that the scripture is very consistent. All through human history, God has allowed corrupt, imperfect, flawed human governments and, and political philosophies of all sorts. None of them are perfect because they are they are run by imperfect human beings. But here's the thing that's true of all of them, even the worst of them. Take communism for an example. The worst of these governmental structures still provides certain things that are absolutely critical. 
They provide some measure of uh, order in society. They provide some measure of safety in society so that human life can go on and that the message of Christ can have pathways, roadways that it can travel through. I mean, all you got to do is, is ask the question. Take the most corrupt, the most terrible government that you can ever think of, and would it be better to have it or would it be better to have absolute anarchy? No government, no law. Everybody's a law to themselves. We all know what happens. When you have anarchy, when you have everyone a law to themselves, you have the most brutal, violent kind of existence. And no one is safe. And so God has established human government with full knowledge that the governors, the kings, are not perfect and sometimes very imperfect. But here's the deal. He's going to judge them. He will hold them accountable. He has appointed them to bring order in society. He has appointed them to reward the good and punish the evil. And when they don't, as in the case of Nero, he may appear to be getting away with it for a time, but I can assure you, God holds him accountable in judgment. You see, judgment and the resurrection kind of balances all the scales for the injustices that go on in this life. But Peter wants, and the Spirit of God wants Christians, he wants us to be motivated to be submissive to our governments, uh, cooperate. Now, I'm going to unpack that word submission for you in just a bit. But let me read on a little bit more, and then we'll kind of backtrack. So, verse 13, or verse 15, he says he, he wants us to do this so that by doing good, we'll silence the ignorant talk of foolish men. He goes on to say in 16, live as free men, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as servants of God. Now, you know, any true freedom has to involve unity with God, His will, His word, because anytime we're outside of God's will and word, we don't have freedom. We lose freedom. We end up receiving consequences in life and not results. And some of us, I'm just going to pause because it could be for somebody good in here. If you're finding that more and more life just won't work for you, you keep trying to make it work your way, and you just keep reaping more consequences than results, it's because your life is not aligned with God's will and His Word. You can't live against the laws of your being. You can't live against the laws of God. So... Uh, there's, a, there's no freedom except within the context of God's will. We are the most free when we completely obey the word and the will of God in every area of our life. All right, so that, that's what he's talking about there, about we're free. You know, we're, we're not, you know, uh, servant to anyone, but yet we're, we're going to live as servants of God and not uh, use it as a cover-up for evil. Verse 17, he says, show proper respect to everyone. Love the brotherhood of believers fear God and that means to have awe and reverence for God and honor the king now he's saying it again he knows Nero's there he knows he's persecuting these Christians but he still says honor him and what he's saying is is you honor the office it doesn't mean you honor the man or his views or even what he's doing at the time but you still do your best to submit and show respect and show honor it's interesting he also says that he wants Christians to show respect for everyone. There's never, ever a human being that you and I encounter. It's going to be hard for some of you because you've um, maybe encountered some pretty bad people that have done some pretty bad things to you in your life. But hear me out. There's never a human being that we encounter that doesn't deserve our respect. It doesn't mean that they haven't done despicable, horrible, maybe very hurtful things. And we shouldn't be targets for those things but as long as they're living and breathing, they're made in the image of God. There's something there left. And Christ died for them. And it's possible, it's really possible that they can yet turn from their evil ways, return to God, be reconciled to Him, and then God will start to change them and transform them to His image. As long as they're breathing, they're not beyond redemption. And we should respect their humanity. We should respect that they're made in the image of God, even though they may be spoiling that image terribly. Even though there may be much about them and things they've done not to respect, we still should respect their humanity. And, and, and that's not a hard thing to do. I've met endless people through the years that I can't respect their lifestyle, what they say, what they do, but I show respect to them. I value them. I care about them. I, I'm seeking their highest well-being and happiness uh, the best that I can. So... He's calling us to this kind of an attitude, this kind of a submission. He wants us to be motivated about this. And then it gets even more difficult in verse 18. 
He says, slaves, submit yourself to your masters. And this is the second time we've had this word submit. It started in verse 13. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every authority instituted among men. Verse 18. Slaves, submit yourself to your masters with all respect, not only to those who are good and considerate, but also to those who are, what does it say? Harsh. For it is commendable if a man bears up under the pain of unjust suffering because he is conscious of God. But how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? But if you suffer for doing good and endure it, this is commendable before God. And I'm not going to read the whole verse, but I'll read a part of it to this you were called. We'll come back and get the rest of it. So here he's calling for a more extreme submission. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about this verse in slavery because I know it's a sensitive issue in our day and we need to understand what the biblical world was like and how this applies to us today because obviously we're not slaves. We do work for people and sometimes we may say they work me like I'm a slave, but it's different. We know that. So let's just kind of get a sense though of what this word submission means. And, and to help you out, I, I have a picture that I think will probably speak more than any words I can say. An orchestra is a beautiful picture of what scripture means, what God means when he's talking about submission. Now the, the people playing the various instruments, they don't think for one second that the person playing the instrument beside them or behind them or in front of them is better than them. They don't think that the conductor is even better to them as far as human worth goes. But what they understand is this, there's a strategic purpose that they consider worthy, okay? The strategic purpose being they want to have beautiful music, beautiful, orderly, har harmon harmonic music come forth to the blessing of others. And to do that, each one of them has to be willing to submit to the musical part that is placed in front of them. And they have to cumulatively submit to the leadership of, you know, the conductor. Now, this is what the scripture is talking about when it says submit. It doesn't mean that we're, we're groveling at people's feet. It doesn't mean that we're acting as though human beings are better than us. It doesn't mean we're afraid of someone. It just means that, that we get it. There's a strategic purpose here. God's up to something, and he's asking us, I want you to be those that cooperate, that fulfill your role, that do the right thing. He keeps repeating, do good in the places where God puts you. Listen to the way that the book of Galatians in the New Testament says it. The Apostle Paul says, let us not become weary in doing good. Sometimes it's tempting because it's not appreciated. It doesn't seem to be rewarded. It doesn't seem to matter. So the Lord is under, he understands that we can get weary in this, but he says, don't. He says, let us not become weary in doing good for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we what? If we don't give up. So he's telling these Christians, keep doing good even though you're, you're suffering the persecution of a brutal dictator. Keep doing good, Christian, though you find yourself a slave. And we'll talk more about what that meant. It says, therefore, as we have opportunity, this is a great uh, description of, of biblical submission. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers, serve one another in love. That's biblical submission. So I, I hope that that gives you a, a more clear picture that doesn't make you feel like it's going to somehow cause you to be this, this cowering person that doesn't have courage to take a stand or that you're somehow uh, throwing your dignity away. Far from it. Far from it. You'll, you'll see in just a moment, Jesus actually says that the person that is submissive because they choose to for the sake of God, like we read earlier, um, is actually the stronger because it takes a lot of strength to be submissive. Listen to what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 20. He said, uh, not so with you. He was comparing the leadership structures of the nations where, you know, the more power you have, the more people grovel and serve you. He's telling his disciples, not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your what? Servant. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man, speaking of himself, did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom or as a payment, a sacrifice for many. So here Jesus is turning everything kind of upside down, but not really. We understand this. He's saying the great person 
is the one that submits, that serves. The great person is the one that comes with a towel over their arm and says, who are you? What can I do to you? How can I bless you? How can I use my time, my talents, my treasure, my experience to build you up? I want to I wanna cooperate. I want to help. Um, and that's the stronger person, not the weaker. It's the stronger person that has the capacity to serve. I can give you a simple example, and you'll know, you'll know this is true. How many of you in here have... Uh, either have or have had children. Can I see your hands? And then I could add in this. How many of you have pets? Can I see your hands? Okay. Now, whether it be children or pets, let's just say it's a child, the baby's just born. Um, who is greater? Uh, who serves who? Because that baby is newborn, does the baby serve you? Or do you serve the baby? Right? You serve the baby because you're the greater. The greater always is the one who serves. Listen, God wants us to come to a place in our life where we feel so significant because of who we are in Christ. Not because of anything anybody says or comparing ourselves to anybody or any standard, but because of who we are in Christ. Christ created us and Christ died for us. We, God wants us to feel so significant and so secure because we know that God's hand is on our life and we know our sins are forgiven and we know we have eternal life because we put our faith in Christ and he wants us to walk through this life with such a sense of significance and security and satisfaction because we're progressively aligning our life with his word and his will that we frankly are pretty full and we just don't need anything. Needy people want others to serve them. Do for me. Meet my needs. Be sensitive to me. Give to me. Do this for me. Help me. But when you get strong, you have the power of objectivity. You just don't need anything. And when you don't find yourself so needy, you can be a servant to others. That's what Jesus was talking about. The one whose heart is big and full of love has the capacity to serve and to give. They don't need anything. They don't need to prove anything to anybody. They don't need anything back. So it's always the greater that submits and serves. And that's what scripture was talking about here. So far from it diminishing our dignity, uh, it takes an awful lot of dignity, God-given dignity, to be this kind of a submissive, cooperative, agent in society so to kind of size this up real simply Christians should be model citizens in any society they find themselves in at any time in human history and they should be model employees and employers but let's dig into this thing a little bit um, about slavery but but before we do let, let me just give you uh, one more one more little physical example of somebody that I think gives us a good depiction of what this submission that uh, is strategic and useful is really like. Uh, there's a guy on the screen, Mike Murphy. He's been with the San Francisco Giants baseball team since 1958. Now he's not a player. He's not getting million dollar contracts. He's not getting, you know, these uh, endorsement contracts making millions of dollars. You won't find his name in the Hall of Fame or anything like that. But he's been with the Giants since 1958. Fif 52 years he waited for them to finally win a World Series in 2010. Now, what he is, well, let me go back. What he started as was their bat boy in 1958. And then he went up to the clubhouse attendant level a little bit later, and then he finally became the equipment manager. And that's what he's been all these years. And he doesn't get any accolades. Most people don't know who he is or anything like that. When they finally won the World Series in 2010, and they had not won it since 1954, a 56-year you know, void there, um, the owner, the first one he took the trophy and put in his hands was not the players, not the superstars, not the multi-million dollar endorsement guys. He put it in his hands because the owner got it. He's a servant. He's submissive. He gives himself to make these other guys look good and to be great. And he doesn't care. He's secure. He does it because he understands his role. That's what Peter's talking about for Christians in society, even in tough societies where the governments are difficult. Now, there is one exception. We have in the book of Acts, in Acts 4.19 and in Acts 5.29, clear exceptions where when the governmental authorities tell the Christians, you can't, you can't preach or teach in the name of Jesus anymore, 
Well, the apostles and the Christians said, you can do with us what you want, but we will obey God and not man. We will not stop preaching or teaching in the name of Jesus. Even when they were flogged and imprisoned, they refused. And so there, there are times where as Christians, we go against the government. But in most cases, that's not what we're called to do. Let's uh, look at one more passage in the New Testament that just sort of affirms the Christian's uh, attitude toward government. It says, everyone must submit himself, there it is again, to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except that which God has established. He knows it's not perfect, but it's better than nothing. The authorities that exist have been established by who? By God. Now you might say, you're kidding me. Nero established by God? Yes, he allowed it. And Nero will be judged severely for the way that he mishandled that. We don't have to worry about it. God's going to take care of business and judgment. Give everyone what you owe him. If you owe taxes, <laughs> if you owe taxes, pay taxes. You can't get away with it anyway. Uh, if revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. Let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. For he who loves his fellow man has fulfilled the law. So here we just have it reemphasized again. We are to be cooperative citizens, uh, even in difficult circumstances. Now, now let's go to that slavery thing, because I know that bothers us. Uh, verse 19, or excuse me, verse 18. Slaves, submit yourselves to your masters with all respect, not only to those who are good and considerate, but also to those who are harsh. It goes on to say that, you know, even if you have to suffer unjustly, do so. Let me give you a picture of why this was the kindest, most loving set of instructions that God could have possibly given to the Christian community at that time. You've got to follow me on this, at that time. In the Roman world, Rome was the dominant empire. New Testament times, there were 60 million slaves 60 million, most of the world were slaves. Why? How did this happen? Rome would go and conquer lands, and when they conquered lands, you became their slave. Most real Romans lived a pampered life of idleness. They just did whatever they wanted. They wouldn't bother themselves, lower themselves to do work. And so if you were a conquered person, you became a slave. Now, slaves in these biblical days when Peter was writing, they were doctors, they were lawyers, they were teachers, they were musicians, they were artists, they were craftsmen, they were everything you can think of. They weren't just what we might think more of the menial labor, far from it. They did all the work in the Roman Empire, slaves, all right? In some cases, the slaves were treated quite warmly, not in all cases, some were. The slaves had one thing going against them, though. They were not looked upon as being human. A slave was looked upon as a tool in Roman law, as property. And a slave owner could do anything that he wanted, anything with his slave, and would not be considered even chargeable to the law. So you've got to get this. The ones that this letter came to had no legal rights at all. None. Zero. They were a conquered people with no legal rights. And Peter is telling them, submit. It's a strategic submission. You're going to see there's a reason behind it. Reason number one, let's just say that the Christians would have all said, you know what, we're free in Christ. We're, we're not slaves. We know that God loves us as much as he loves them. And we're going to band together and we're not taking this anymore. We're going to fight you. Well, let me just tell you what would have happened. The Roman army was a monstrous military machine. And all these slaves would have been slaughtered quite quickly. It wouldn't have been a problem at all. And Rome was cold, and they were very effective at what they did. This saved their physical lives, but let me go further. This actually saved their inner lives as well. They could maintain their dignity that the Roman Empire was trying to strip away. They're being told, you're God's agent in essence. You're planted there. God sees what's going on. If you go through this and you continue to do good, God's going to commend you. He's going to reward you. And don't you worry. He'll deal with them too in judgment. 
And so you can retain your peace. You can know that even in this terrible set of circumstances, what you do matters to God. And it's going to matter in eternity. And so you can retain your peace and your dignity. You don't have to fight against it. And was the strategy wise? Well, let's let history be the judge. By 326, a man named Constantine was the Roman emperor. And he declares the whole Roman Empire Christian because... There had been so many people that had converted and turned to Christ that he couldn't function without it. They followed this track of submissiveness and it broke the back of slavery and even of the Roman Empire because they did it God's way. Had they openly resisted and rebelled, it would have been put down and the Christians would have been looked upon as those that are trouble and the message of Christ would have been hated and despised and all the accusations that the Romans were making toward the Christian community would have been validated in this way they were not validated and many times when these Christians would would suffer and continue to do good and be loving and be righteous it would penetrate the darkened heart and hearts of some of these Romans and that's how they became Christians and you had situations where the master and the slave were both Christians the book of Philemon in your New Testament, it's a one chapter book, read it on your own. It's about a situation where a master, a Roman, was a Christian and his slave Onesimus fled away, who was also a Christian. They had a dispute and the apostle Paul sends Onesimus back and he instructs them both. He says, come on guys, your brothers, work this out. So what seems to be terrible on the surface for the time was not. Now, we live in a day and age where slavery has been abolished, thankfully, except for in Islamic lands where it's still practiced. But uh, for this time, this was not God putting his stamp of approval on slavery. And that's what some have taken this to be. It is not. It is God being gracious and wise and kind and keeping channels open so that the message of Christ will still be desirable to the Roman Empire of that day. Okay, so we see that Peter wants us to be motivated to do some strange things, to be submissive to authority, to, to be submissive to uh, slave owners. Now, now, we could apply this to our situation today, our bosses, you know, employers and employees. And let me just say this, we have a lot more legal grounds than what these slaves had. They had no, no way to respond. But if you're in a work situation where your boss is treating you badly and abusively, well, you, you have things you can do. You can take legal action, you can quit, you can change jobs, you can do all these things. But having said that, I suspect that in many cases, we walk through our days complaining about too much stress and how bad things are uh, and how terrible the boss is. And, and maybe God would be saying the same thing to us. Why don't you just submit and take it up a notch. Give your level best. Give more than your level best, even though it's not being appreciated. In the book of Colossians 3.23, it says, Do all things heartily as unto the Lord, not unto men. I'm just going to say something. I have a strong bias on this. I mean, I, I did secular work for 17 years. So I, I know what it's like. And I believe with all my heart, a Christian, a follower of Christ, should be the best employee or employer wherever they're at. The Christian should never be the one that the, won't work unless the boss's eye is on them. The Christian should never be the one standing around whispering and backstabbing and, and sabotaging the company or saying bad things, slanderous things about the bosses or the leaders. And, and Never, never should that be a Christian. A Christian should never be the one that's whining and groaning and complaining and moaning. And I'm not going to go any further on that one. And a Christian should never be the one that shows up late and misses time when they don't have to. That's a pitiful contradiction of what Christ wants us to be in the field of work. And work matters. God ordained work before sin. He told Adam and Eve, hey, work. Work the Garden of Eden. And so, listen, your work environment even if it's an unjust, tough one, it's a place where you have an opportunity to shine. I've been there. I know what it's like. I've done it. I've lived this stuff out. It can be done. It should be done by all of us if we're followers of Christ. And that's what Peter was saying to us. We're not slaves, but we still have a context where sometimes we're not treated fairly, right? And we can get mad and we can get, you know, all bitter inside. Or we can submit 
and try to show that we're going to do good no matter what. We're people driven by principle, not by somebody else's control. All right. So he wants us to be motivated uh, to do these things. But, but, but why? Why? Well, it goes back really to the earlier verse 10 where he says that, that we're a called people and we're called to declare the praises of God. We're to make known the truth about God and his grace and his goodness. And to do that, our conduct has to be consistent and we have to keep the lines of communication open. And to do that, we have to function with government in a way that government doesn't despise us or think that we're troublemakers. And we also, in our work environments, have to try to keep the channels open because sometimes the most hard-hearted people turn out to be reachable. I asked this in the first service, so I'll ask it again. How many of you have ever had the experience of somebody that you thought they are the nastiest, most hard-hearted, awful human being? They'll ne they attack God. They attack everything that's holy and good. They're just, they're just slime. They're awful. And lo and behold, somewhere down the line, you find out this individual opens up their heart and they turn to Christ and they become entirely different people. How many of you ever known situations like that? I know I certainly have. And so sometimes if we just hang in there and be submissive and sometimes suffer unjustly but we continue to do good and keep a good attitude, we might be the one that, that penetrates that hard heart because sometimes it's in these circumstances that people see the beauty of Christ's character coming through us and the ugliness of their behavior and this collision, this dynamic collision opens up some of their hearts and some of them change. History's recorded numerous instances of that kind of thing. So this is one of the reasons that uh, he wants us to be motivated for this. He wants us to be able to continue to powerfully affect our society. Let me give you an example of where uh, a sacrifice that um, didn't seem to be you know, necessary or advantageous, turns out to be really worthy because there was an overarching strategic reason for it. There's a guy on the screen, or a couple guys, uh, Ivan Fernandez Anaya. He's a uh, cross country or, or a long distance runner uh, uh, on a you know, global level. And Abel Matai, he's a guy from Kenya who actually is an Olympic medalist. They were having a cross country race in Spain. This is December 2nd, 2012. And you might notice it looks like that Anaya is pointing with his finger to uh, Abel Matai, the Kenyan. And in fact, he is. Here's what actually happened in the race. The Kenyan was way ahead. Uh, he was the obvious winner of the race. And Anaya was behind him. But what happened was all of a sudden, Abel Matai just stopped running because he was confused. He couldn't see the finish line. He didn't know where it was. Anaya knew where the finish line was, and so instead of racing right by him, he stopped. And he's pointing to Matai, and he's saying, there's the finish line, and he refused to go in front of him. Now, his coach, a guy named Fitz, just hated it. <laughs> he said, hey, if you're not in it to win, you know, I don't, I don't want to be. And he was pressed by a lot of other people, and finally the reporters pinned him down, and he wouldn't give an inch. He said, no, he says, listen, I did the right thing. Matai won that race, and in an age where everywhere you look, there's corruption, and everybody's out for themselves in sports, in, in soccer, in politics, everywhere you look. He said, I believe it's important that somebody show that honesty really, really matters. So this guy deliberately sacrificed something that would be very advantageous to him as far as positioning and future events. Uh, on a global scale because he felt that producing an environment that understands how important once again honesty is was more important than his personal loss that's the same thing Peter's saying here he's saying you Christians if you're willing sometimes to undergo even unjust sufferings powerful things can happen let's go on and read back in Peter and you'll see where he goes with this he says in verse 20, But how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? But if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. To this you were called, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you, what does it say? An example that you should follow in his steps. Listen, Jesus was punished and brutalized. He didn't deserve any of it. But he accepted it because there was a strategic purpose in it. Listen, there's no merit in suffering for suffering's sake. It's not what Scripture teaches. 
But there are times when suffering creates a dynamic spiritual situation which may be more important than our personal disadvantage at the time. Listen to what this passage goes on to say about Christ. Verse 22, it says, He committed no sin, no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not, what is the word? Retaliate. Listen, Jesus could have, he could have vaporized everyone around him that was attacking him with the blink of an eye. He could have used his power destructively to control. But if he did that, he would have only reinforced the slanderous lie that one of the angels started way, way back. The lie was this, is that God is all about power, that God is all about control, that he creates everything to use it to feed his own ego, and that he doesn't really love us. He doesn't use his power to serve his created beings. He uses his power to feed on us. And had Jesus used his power at that time to just obliterate them, it would have only reinforced that lie. When you come to the end of the Bible, you find something very interesting. There's a change. People are begging God to judge. They are, they are seeing that he's good, that he's totally unselfish, that he only uses power discriminate, discriminatingly for the good of the universe. And now they're begging him, don't hold back anymore. Please unleash your judgment. Clean this mess. Don't let it go on. They're all four angels, humans, all cheering God on to judge and to take control because they know now from the sacrifice of the cross that he's absolutely trustworthy. But had he used his power then, it would have just uh, affirmed the suspicions that Satan had already planted in the hearts of angels and that we struggle with. Come on, let's be real. The reason we disobey God a lot of times is simply because we're not really sure that he knows what we need. We're not really sure that he really cares that much about our happiness. We kind of think that we're going to be happier and better off if we do things our way, at least in this area of our life, because we don't trust him. We think that he wants to assert power to control us for some use that he gets out of it, as opposed to he's guiding us into the way of the highest life, the most blessed life we can have. And so Christ's sacrifice, it puts this whole thing in a clear light. Evil is made to be seen for the evil that it is, and God's goodness is, is unveiled as well. So it says he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats, Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. Again, he trusted the Father. He knew the Father was seeing what was going on, and we should trust God when we are being treated unjustly. He sees it. He'll deal with it in his own time. It says of Jesus, he himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. Now that doesn't have anything to do with physical healing. That comes from Isaiah chapter 1 and Isaiah 53. The wound is that determination we have to do things our way, to be our own self-originators, to be our own God, so to speak. And that wound in our soul gets healed when we see that God is more trustworthy than we are and when we see a God that will die on a cross for us to express his love for us then for some of us, it makes us die to sin and say, all I want to do from now on is live for righteousness. I want to follow this Jesus, this creator, this, this savior. Did that describe you? You see, sin loses its, its allure when you see the heart of God in Christ on the cross. That's what this passage is saying. He gave himself for us that we would die to sins and live for righteousness by his wounds you have been healed, for you were like sheep going astray. We all were going our own way. But now you have returned to the shepherd. That's an interesting word there. You know, we, we all know the shepherd and the sheep. It, it's the same word used for pastor. And the overseer of your souls. Jesus is our shepherd, our protector, our guide. He nurtures. He takes care of us. But he's also our director, our overseer. And we need that. Human beings and angels, we are not adequate and competent to rule ourselves. We're finite. We're created. This is what history has proven. Left to ourself, you get this earth. But when we return to our, our shepherd, our overseer, life starts to take the uh, alignment that it was meant to have. So Christians are urged to submit strategically and to sacrifice and suffer strategically if necessary so that 
the majority of people that can be reached or the, or the most people that can be reached with the message of Christ can be reached. And these create dynamic situations that sometimes open hearts that can't be opened in any other way. In 2 Corinthians 5, the Apostle Paul said, For Christ's love compels us because we're convinced that one died for all and he died for all that those that live should no longer live, what does it say, for who? For themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. Romans 12 just adds this. It says, therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercies, offer your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. When we are submissive and sacrificial, people see something of this this heart of Christ that makes them want to also give themselves as living sacrifices. I want to close with a story that uh, comes from a movie that was made in 1999. Probably uh, won't be familiar to most, but it was a movie called Three Seasons, and it was the first movie where Americans went back into Vietnam after the war and were allowed to, you know, put together a film. And the film consists of, you know, three or four vignettes uh, little, little pieces of people's story and life and uh, Harvey Keitel is in the thing but uh, there's one story in particular about this rickshaw driver you know that's those bicycles with the cart and his name is Hai and this this girl that he falls in love with named Lon she's a prostitute uh, she's a beautiful girl and they meet in kind of an unusual way she has had a bad experience with a client and has to literally run for her life out of the hotel where she was carrying out her business and she's running down the street for her life and and high is just sitting there with his rickshaw and that's how they meet he takes her in the rickshaw and whisks her away and saves her and then the relationship develops and he just falls completely in love with Lon but all Lon thinks about is getting out of the poverty she lives in. She lives in grinding poverty. She goes to the city and plies her trade, but then she goes home to live in grinding, horrific poverty. And she dreams that the money she makes in prostitution will be her freedom, her ticket to freedom, to go into the city and live like the people uh, that she serves, so to speak, like her clients. And as it goes on, you know, this relationship is, is kind of, you know, off and on. And, and finally... A change occurs. High wins a contest, a rickshaw race contest. And he gets first prize, and it's a good sum of money. He goes to Lon, who he loves, and he says, I want to purchase a night with you. And she agrees. They go to the hotel, and she's expecting a similar experience, another client, that he's just one more person that wants to take his power and use her. And she prepares and then he tells her, no, you're, you're not understanding. All I want to do, all I want to do is I just want to watch you sleep. She had always dreamt of being able to just live in the city and sleep a whole night in peace in that environment instead of her poverty. And he said, I want nothing. I just want to watch you sleep. Now, her reaction was not what you might think. She was a bit angry and edgy because she thought this was just another ploy, just another way to try to use his power to gain control over her. And so she didn't really open her heart. But Hyde just kept on with this kind of interaction. And finally, she slowly but surely becomes convinced she's met somebody that, that all they want to do with their power is serve her. They don't want to use her. And as it goes on, it transforms her. It becomes impossible for her to continue prostitution. It changes her heart. And Peter is saying to Christians, submit even to less than perfect authority figures. And yes, suffer if necessary sacrificially for a while because our God wants to prove to humanity that he does not want to use them. He does not use his power that way. He wants to use his power, and he wants them to know his power is only to serve his creator, his created beings, angels and humans. And when we let that truth into our heart, it causes us to die to sins. 
It has no more allure for us. And it causes us to hunger and thirst after righteousness. And we become normal again. We fall in love with our Creator. And that's the normal human life. We're not normal. We're not normal until we actually love our Creator who has given Himself to us in the person of Jesus. And we can help others take that step by being submissive and, if necessary, strategic sacrificial suffers that the message can get through. I'm going to ask you something. I mean, I wonder if maybe, I'm not trying to poke fun or, or poke finger in a sore spot, but I wonder if some of us, some of what we're calling stress, some of what we're calling aggravation, some of what we're describing as I can't take, you know, anymore and all this kind of thing, it, it's simply because we're looking, we're looking for something easy and God's saying, but I want you to submit. I want you to cooperate with a good attitude. Maybe even he's saying, I, I want you to endure some unjust sufferings for a while because it's going to allow me to, to express myself powerfully to someone if you'll do this. And maybe we're losing peace and we're losing joy because we're fighting against it. We're angry. We're mad. We can't stand it, we say. We can't take anymore. And so we lose our peace. We lose our joy. And on top of it all, we're not effective and God wants us to have joy and peace and be effective. And maybe he's telling some of us somewhere where we've been fighting and fighting and fighting. Why don't you just submit? Why don't you just suffer for a while? If you're sure that's going to further the cause of Christ. It's just a thought. It may not apply to you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for once again the, uh, the clarity, the security that your truth gives us in this very, very tumultuous, difficult world of ours. Uh, give us that, that interior strength by your spirit that we can submit and be servants with full hearts, with capacity to give. And even if necessary, to, to suffer even unjustly suffer for the sake of your gospel going forward where it would not be able to had we resisted. Give us this kind of strength. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen.